I'm a professor of Islamic law and Sharia at UCLA School of Law. Thank you. Um, you've talked in the past about uh, in an article about dog hospital traditions in an article, Dogs in Islamic Tradition and Nature. Are these traditions part of the Quran? Is, is there an interpretation? Um, a lot of people assume that many of the uh, laws of Islamic law come from the Quran, and that's not a fair assumption. Um, the, the, no, the Quran doesn't have hostile traditions to dogs. The hostile traditions come from uh, traditions that were attributed to the Prophet Muhammad uh, as part of what is called the Sunnah, his oral tradition. And um, unlike the Quran, the uh, traditions attributed to the Prophet Muhammad are not divine, they're not revelation. The Muslims don't consider them as revelation. Uh, and there is always a huge debate about what's authentic and what's not authentic, but what's properly attributed to him and what's not properly attributed to him. The, the, in fact, the, the only parts of the Quran that does talk about dogs uh, it actually talks about them very positively, unlike some of the oral traditions attributed to the Prophet. Uh, so, the, uh, in one of the Quran's narratives, for example, uh, the story of the people of the cave, which also exists in the biblical tradition, uh, where a group of pious individuals uh, go to sleep for a hundred years in a cave and then are awakened by God and so on. In the Quranic narrative, it, it points out that while they slept in the cave, they were guarded and protected by a dog. And it, it's, a, it's a long thing, but basically the way that the Quran talks about dogs is actually quite positive. They're, they're, they're um, uh, related in the narrative always as friends of human beings. The hostile traditions are these oral transmissions attributed to the Prophet and they are, they fall in two categories. Uh, one category that focuses on the saliva of dogs, saying something to the effect that the saliva of dogs are not pure. And uh, and so that, that's one genre. The second genre uh, draws a parallel between black dogs in particular and the demonic, um, or devils, mm -hmm. demons. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, at the same time that you have these traditions, you have other traditions attributed to the Prophet that are actually quite pro-dog. Uh, so, one tradition, for instance, says that uh, the Prophet used to pray with a puppy playing around him. Um, uh, another tradition uh, uh, says that a, uh, a man who, sa who saved the life of a, a dying dog uh, was forgiven all his sins because he saved the dying dog and went to heaven. Um, another tradition says a woman who starved the cat to death was doomed to hell uh, because she killed the cat, uh, tortured the cat by starving the cat. Uh, God decreed that she, that all her de deeds were nullity and that she must go to hell. Um, 
there was one of the companions of the Prophet known as Abu Huraira, means the father of the cat, because he would always go around at the time of the Prophet with a cat on his shoulder. He was a big cat lover. He was known to be a big cat lover. Um, and so on. I mean, there are, the Islamic, uh, 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 you know, we, we should always try to avoid the reductionism of saying, well, if it's in Islam, it must come from the Quran. Because, for instance, a lot of people don't know that there's a whole genre of literature in Islam that celebrates the characteristics, the the uh, the uh, personality characteristics of dogs. One very famous book that was written in early Islam and had a huge influence, and it's been translated to English. Actually, it's a book called "The Superiority of Dogs." Uh, over human beings, and the uh, the author of this book was a very well known jurist, and set out to prove why dogs are superior in moral instinct to human beings, and how much Muslims can learn from studying the ethics of dogs, and so on and so forth.